Hi everybody, it's great to be here. And I must say before uh, going ahead that really I'm nobody to discover passion because my passion discovered me. And this happened many, many years earlier when I was a little kid who grew up in a big family of many, many siblings, Muslim ghetto, so to speak, small town, big city with a small town mentality, Kanpur. And that's where it all started. The incessant questioning, the curiosity, the need to know more, not willing to take anything at face value. Everything that was given to me by my parents or my teachers or even religious gurus and uh, teachers at home was constantly challenged by me. I was into challenging stereotypes. And believe you me, people thought I was one insufferable child, one young adult who had problems. There were so many questions and so many uh, you know, inquiries constantly from everybody around me, from me, that really I must have been a tough, tough kid to handle. So full marks to my parents for putting up with me. So when you grow up in a, in a big family, first of all, you learn to speak fast because nobody's there to listen to you. You learn how to make alliances, this brother and that sister. You're constantly doing that. You know, you become an expert in coalition politics of sorts because, you know, you're always making this gut bandhan some way or the other. So you learn to do that. And if you grow up and you see that there are constantly things being given to you that are incongruent with your reality. And I'll tell you, I was about nine. And like they say, women must be seen and not heard. But I was one big chatterbox for yourself, but to others around you. And that's how I think my, this is a genesis of my passion. Nothing great, inspirational or profound, but yes, that act of uh, anger, that little spark of, of rage that became like a forest fire of passion that wanted you to reach out and make life not just easier for you, but for others around you. So constantly being told something from your, uh, either the religious scriptures, and I couldn't believe it because I was told that f questioning continued, that women in Mecca and Medina go to mosques, but in UP there were no mosques for women. So you wondered, the right of religious congregation was not there. There is no caste system in Islam, but in India there is a caste system. I wondered why there weren't any fatwas, you know, for, for education, which is prescribed in Talim, in, in Quran. So one wondered question, uh, and questioned constantly as to why you were being told something that is not true. And that's how life went on. And there were these stereotypes that tag along, that, that make your identity the way it is, constrict you constantly, put you in a box, and I wasn't going to stay in a box from one box to the other, from the other box to the third, no. I like the space in between boxes. I like to create my own box. My box did not be a, of a particular shape. It could be amorphous, it could be amoeba-like. My box had to be different. My box would expand constantly. And that's how I pushed the limits of my being and my identity. So my struggle continued. And as I grew older, the stereotypes, the hackneyed adverbs continued. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. You've all heard it, right? Now, diamonds were never my best friend. I like newspapers, I like stationery, I like books, and I still do. I get bored with diamonds. So I wondered whether the desire to have a diamond ring would be a rare or tetra of any, every woman's being. It wasn't mine. I wasn't just waiting, and I don't think this, the act of being presented a diamond ring or be proposed to would complete my being, you know. There was more to me than just that. And that's what I wondered about, whether we believe what we do from the language around us, from the conditioning around us, or a true blue national desire. And I remember traveling in a, in a train in Shatabdi, where the newspaper guy was handing out the newspapers, and he just looked at the women and the girls and just thought it's a waste of time to give them the newspapers. And it bugged me no my end, and I said, I want to read the paper. He said, Angrezi ka hai. I said, nah, Hindi ka de do, par akbar mujhe padna hai. And the bias that I, that I faced in Chamanganj Kanpur continued in public spaces. And it continued even later when I passed out of Jamia Mascom and learned to be a reporter and got technically trained to do the same. The same biases, my friends, continued in those big swanky plush offices and studios of Mumbai and Delhi. The same biases. And they saw me, notwithstanding the fact that I topped, I was the youngest student ever out of Jamia Mascom, they looked at me and they said, you should cover lifestyle. Oh, 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 you're a very sweet girl. You should cover, you know, home, fashion, Bollywood, music. And I said, no, I don't want to. I want to cover politics. 
I want to cover defense. I want to cover home ministry. I want to cover all of that. I don't want to cover uh, just fashion in Bollywood. That's not meant to be. So what I'm trying to tell you that you're always, always being held by a box. And somebody's dying to put you in a box. Many years later, and I must tell you this, you know when political debates happen on television and there's breaking news and the election results are coming in? And I was just a debut anchor at that point of time with Star Network. And I was told, uh, you know, Shazia, you come in and you read the news, the headlines, and the distinguished men would uh, discuss the results and all of that. And I said, boss, I don't want to do that. It's like that Ajit ka joke, you know, Robert, tum sona leke aao. Michael, tum cycle pe jao. Or Lily, tum nahati raho. I said, I'm not going to be that Lily ever in my life. I, that is not for me. No Mona darlings and Lily for me. I said, make Ajay the Lily. Make Gaurav the Lily. I am not going to be the Lily of this office. My boss is conceded. And I got to participate more in the news thing. But it also comes from the desire to challenge stereotypes. And stereotypes govern your life. It's a never, never ending story. So also I heard another thing, and you must have heard it. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. You've heard it, right? Now, what, what do you do with a stomach like mine that is always hungry? I want to be served. I don't want to cook. I like food too much. And the best part of the kitchen is the fridge for me. I went to a hostel. So for me, I couldn't accept it. And it was tough really growing up because a woman's innate desire is to want to cook, right? Clean, cook, sew, stitch. That's the purpose of my life, isn't it? But it wasn't the purpose of my life. The purpose of my life is to hog, have fun, question people, bug them, irritate them, the living daylights out of them. So there was this wonderful, uh, well, cousin of sorts, a very close family friend, Ruksana, who did everything right. She was Miss Perfect. Very bad in studies, and I helped her with homework, but it didn't matter. But she cooked very well. She listened to her Ammi Abba very nicely. So she was a proverbial good girl. And my mother would spare no, not a chance to praise her. Singing odes to her, praising her constantly. So I told her once in this state of angst that I was in, you know, watching this Tamasha go on and on. I said, thank God Ruksana's parents, that is the aunt and the uncle, the same auntie and uncle, are not drug peddlers or murderers. So my mom almost, I mean, she resisted the urge to slap me. She said, how can you talk like that? I said, see, imagine, if they were drug peddlers, she would be a drug peddler. If they were murderers, she would be a murderer. She has no brains of her own. She doesn't question. So thank God they're good people because that's why she's a good person. <laughs> so my mother just saw no merit in this argument and she just thought I was just too argumentative and horrible. And I really feel sorry because I must have been one insufferable person, kid at that point of time, asking these questions constantly, constantly, constantly. And these biases continued. But I think somewhere this anger that was there in me, also growing up, in, in, in UP, coming from a ghetto-like uh, neighborhood that I came from, uh, in Nenital, Delhi, you get very uh, incensed almost uh, by people looking at you. Every minute of your space outside your house is spent being ogled at, being stared at. It starts off when you're nine or 10 and it continues. So there is this whole multitude of eyes looking at you constantly and you're in a rickshaw squirming away with socks till here, with skirt till here, trying to cover your knees, your poor knees with a bag, but you're being looked at. Everybody just wants to gape at you, gawk at you. It goes on and on and on. And that was, that was really scary and it defined who I was because I just didn't want to be looked at. And believe me, at the age of 12, I thought of a great thing. I thought I'm gonna make faces really scary faces, zombie-like faces, grotesque faces to repulse people. When I got onto the bus, I would just start pretending as if I got whooping cough or something, diphtheria attack, and I would convulse just to scare people off, to prevent them from attacking me. But the anger was there, right? So I did these silly things constantly. And I, I remember this particular incident when a man was pressing against me, bugging me, almost hurting me with his shoulder, just trying to get very close, and it happens to many, many girls and they would vouch for that. He just pushed me and I said, what are you doing? Kya kar rahe bhai? And he said, Bheed hai, lag gai hogi. And I said, I'm going to keep my anger alive. I was at that point of time, maybe 20. And I said, no, this is not going to work. I will not get used to the idea of being stared at, or being leshed at, or being ogled at, 
or being stalked or somebody misbehaving with me or treating me just as an object. No, I'm not just a body. I'm much more than that. I'm not parts of my anatomy. I'm much more than that. I'm a mind. I'm a spirit. I'm kidneys. I'm lungs. I've got liver. I've got much more than some parts of anatomy, right? There's much more to me than just a body and some parts of it. So I'm not taking this. And you know, I got up, I plotted this. So he was sitting ahead by that time he'd got a seat. And I literally went, my stop was closed. So I went and stood on his foot and jumped, really jumped. Hurt him. I must have hurt him badly, guys, sorry. <laughs> but, and I said, Bheer hai lag gai yogi. Because there was anger in me. There was constant anger of being looked at, of being put into a box, of being expected to do certain things that were not my natural innate desire. I wanted to break the conditioning, the social conditioning that is there, that governs every bit of your being, all the time. And that's how my journey continued. It is in, in pursuit of that, that I decided to do something not just for myself, not just to empower myself, but to go ahead, to reach out and help the child, the, the, the child that, that was hurt, or that was angry, or that was helpless, or that was worked up, to go out there and not just fight for oneself, but fight for others. So there are many proverbs like that that, that govern us. You must have heard of, um, don't ask a man his wage and a woman her age. So it's like men are defined by what they do, by their work, by the body of work, or by how distinguished and accomplished they are. But woman, she's pretty much trapped in this bubble of youth. So if she's 25 or 30, oh, she's over the hill. Let's send her to some caves. She doesn't belong. Because she, after all, is a body. The youth is gone. The usefulness is gone. The purpose is gone. The vitality is gone. But we are not just our bodies. We are more than that. We are not just a number. We just not... And while men can go ageless and timeless and look and con continue to be thought of Josh Looney handsome with their graying hair, it's we women have to constantly work on squeezing ourselves into, you know, all kinds of corsets and spandex and what have you, right? And it's not, so there's life after 30, after 40, after 50, because you are you. So while men continue to be great people, they're also sons, they're also husbands, they're also fathers, but men are men, they have a life. So women have a life too. They're also sisters, they're also mothers, they're also daughters, they're also girlfriends, but they're also themselves, right? And that's the point I want to make going beyond the limits and boundaries that are set, prescribed for you by whoever, by different institutions, by constantly asking questions, pushing, pushing the limits of your being and becoming limitless. And I think that's my passion is, taking it forward, making the small spark of anger into a forest fire of change, that change that inspires others and keep you inspired, that makes you reach out many children out there who face the same kind of injustice, helplessness, voicelessness, and, 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 and make it a passion of my life. Another thing, and I hear it ever so ha often, vanity, thy name is woman. It's like we, we are defined by our looks, by our youthfulness, by, by all the bodily virtues. While, while men derive their identity through their work, through their money, through their status, through power, Women are constantly defined, constantly, by youth and beauty. And that is something that must change. And that is something I set out to do in my endless pursuit to, to challenge stereotypes. Last but not the least, and very importantly so, I think it's very important to... The last stereotype that we hear about knight in shining armor. And I realize that we grew up on that kind of... Mughli Ghutti Paso Pachpan. You know, night in Shaming and Ayana, there'll be a night coming to you, to rescue you. And I decided that I'm not waiting for any night. I'll be my own knight in my own shining armor, and my shining armor will be that of passion. And like a knight, I will fight for myself and for many, many, many girls and guys and men and women like me, seeking a better tomorrow, a better deal for ourselves, now, today and forever. Thank you. Thank you.